Hi, welcome back. This topic today is on uh, uh, the difference between population versus uh, sample data and on descriptive statistics. Okay, so descriptive versus inferential statistics. Um, if you look at almost any stats book, right, the early chapters are concentrated on descriptive statistics, which if you see the first bullet point here, uh, describe data. All right, it's the process of collecting, presenting, organizing, and describing data. And that description can be visual with graphs, histograms, and pie charts, and bar graphs, and line charts. Uh, it could also be numeric the mean, the median, the mode, the variance, the standard deviation, the interquartile range, the, the range, the max, the min, these kind of things, uh, describe data. Okay, but you're not at that point using data to say anything, uh, to, to infer anything about something unknown. And so inferential statistics, the second bullet point, is um, usually made up of the, of, the, of the last half of any uh, stats book, at least at the undergraduate level. <clears throat> and um, and inferential statistics is about drawing conclusions or making decisions concerning a population based only on sample data, right? And so if you think about um, any sort of uh, general election in the United States, um, you know, when we're, when we're moving up to uh, a presidential election, let's say, in, in, a, in every four years in November, um, almost every other day uh, up until election day, uh, there's a poll conducted by, you know, Gallup, CNN, you know, um, a host of, 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 of credible polling agencies uh, will do this. And a lot of people actually um, synth synthesize all those together to come up with kind of a poll of polls. But anyway, when the, a poll is taken out of, I don't know how many um, registered voters you have, in, but let's say there's 200 million Americans that can vote, just for, for instance, um, uh, only about a thousand or twelve hundred people are asked in a given day um, who they're going to vote for, and from that, okay, the headline of a Gallup poll or a CNN poll is you know that seventy or forty three percent are are predicted to vote for Mitt, Mitt Romney in November, for for instance, um, and so uh, that sample which is in absolute terms pretty small 1200 is uh, is actually a reasonable sample size to infer something about um, millions and millions of people all right if that sample is taken correctly so it, it has to represent the uh, the population of interest which is um, uh, voting Americans and so some people find that actually striking that's only 1200 people are used to infer something about the entire country uh, but there is um, <clears throat> sound uh, statistics behind that, and once we get to chapter uh, the the chapter on um, um, uh, sampling distributions, that should be uh, that should be clearer. So right now we want to talk about the difference between population parameters, and I have both of those PP there in blue, uh, and sample statistics. So PP SS, uh, keeping these uh, uh, separate is important. Um, most of this or much of this may be uh, just intuitive, uh, but uh, humor me as we go through some of these slides. So here's a CBS News poll um, uh, way back in 2005. The majority of Americans reject evolution is the um, headline. And so you see these three uh, results. Uh, God created human present form. We see 51% of respondents say that. 30% uh, say humans evolved, God guided that process. And 15% say humans evolved, God did not guide the process. And so the 51% um, uh, that say God created humans in pre present form is extrapolated to that headline of the majority of Americans reject evolution. So the question could be, what's the population of interest? Or the first question, the second question is, what's the sample? So what's the population of interest? Um, well, let's see. Down here in, in, in italics, it says this poll was conducted among a nationwide random sample of 808 Americans interviewed by uh, telephone. Um, so a sample of 808 Americans is used to extrapolate what the, the, the country thinks. Uh, however, it's 
it's not specifically spelled out here, but my guess is that they don't, they're not, um, the CBS isn't interested in what my uh, three, three-year-old daughter thinks about um, uh, the evolution of humans. Um, and so my guess is, is that their population of interest is adult Americans. All right. And if you look into the fine print of their study, you may get some more information there. So I would say that Americans are, or adult Americans. Um, and their sample, of, of course, is the 808. Okay, so we're looking at um, uh, millions upon millions of people in the population and 808 people in our sample. All right. Uh, before we move on, I want, want you to keep in mind that we, we're going to be learning to be statisticians step by step. So early on in this course and in the early chapters of any textbook, uh, you're going to know information about the population. Okay. Uh, unlike here, which is a, re a research question, uh, CBS conducted the poll because they didn't know the answer. They didn't know what the population actually thinks about evolution, so they ask 808 people. Um, but uh, unlike that, in bullet point two, um, although we aren't likely to know population parameters for interesting questions, we're going to start this course knowing that information. And the reason is, is that we want to understand what distributions of data look like, okay, the, the, the kind of data that, that we're after, you know, the properties of a population, so that when we're taking a sample, okay, we have a good understanding of what's going to underlie that sample. And, and this is going to be important. And again, Chapter 8 plays a role. The sampling distribution is when you take multiple samples from a population, all right, and lo and behold, it turns out that we don't even need to know what that population looks like, okay, because of, uh, well, some things that rely on, namely the central limit theorem. Okay, but we're going to start the course knowing what the population looks like, and then we'll start taking these things away. All right, that's that third bullet point. So descriptive statistics, uh, in general, what the data looks like, and this is not just um, you know, graphical representation of data, it's also numeric. So when you describe a distribution of data, when I say a distribution of data, you know, don't let that, that term distribution scare you. That just means if I'm organizing data, you know, you could think of if I, if I had a column of data in Excel, you know, I don't know, 200 observations, and I rank them from smallest to lar largest, so I organize them in that fashion. And then let's say I created a histogram, just a picture of that data, right? Well, those, the, the act of doing that, I could find the, uh, that histogram would, could give me a, a general shape of this data. Okay, and the shape is going to be um, important. In my example, there are normal di distributions, that bell-shaped distribution, right? It's symmetric, and, uh, and uh, uh, the bell-shaped is the normal distribution. The center of the distribution is something that we'd be, we're going to be interested in. We're actually going to concentrate on the, on the mean, the average. Uh, but there are other measures of central tendency. The median is one, and that's often used. Uh, the mode is less often used because often the mode has nothing to do with the center of a data set. It could but often it does not. And so we, we, we will neglect the mode in this, in this course. Um, so we have the shape. We want to know what the shape looks like. We want to know where the center is, the measure of central tendency, and then how much the data vary. So the variability or variation. And our chosen uh, metrics are going to be <clears throat> the variance and the square root of the variance, which is the standard deviation. The standard deviation tells us how much on average our data deviate from the mean. Okay, deviate from the average uh, value. So let's look a little bit at these three. Um, measures of central tendency first. So we're going to go to the second bullet point first. Uh, the mean, the mode, the median. These things apply to both population and sample data. So they apply to the, you know, the 200 million Americans of the population and the 808 Americans in our sample from our previous slide. Okay. Uh, moreover, Comparisons between these, namely the mean and the median, comparisons between the mean and the median can give us an understanding of how the data are skewed or which direction they're skewed if they are. In this case, this is a, and we'll see this graph again, this is a histogram for semester grades <clears throat> and the bars of the histogram are just spaced out just to, for no reason. Um, and this, these are semester grades, so uh, it doesn't go to, the, to, to zero on the horizontal axis, but it does go to um, uh, 4.6. Uh, that was what somebody earned for the entire semester. Um, 
then, but you see that most of the data are, you know, above 55 or above 60. Most people pass, you know, the vast majority. And this is very typical of grading distributions. Grading distributions are very seldomly normal. Uh, they're often with this is left skewed. And in fact, we could tell that this data set is left skewed by a comparison of the mean, the, the mean and the median. And we'll do that in a few slides. All right. Uh, and so this kind of smooth distribution, this red line, is um, an approximation. And that's the kind of thing that, that you'll see in most textbooks, you'll see in my graphs, is that you'll see these smooth lines. And these are, uh, for the most part, you have to think of those as approximately smooth. Um, and uh, that allows us to um, use Z and T tables, which are, are basically uh, integrations under these smooth distributions, uh, so we can find areas under those curves. Um, the mode is the most frequently observed value. Uh, this is the last slide. I'm going to talk about the mode. It may not exist as a problem. There could be multiple modes, and it often doesn't reflect the center. The mean is going to be our chosen um, uh, measure of central tendency. That's not to say it doesn't have problems. Uh, we talk about it, the, the last bullet point here. It's, it's sensitive to extreme values. Often when income is reported at the um, at a country level, let's say, it's the median income that's reported because the mean income takes account of all the va values. It takes all data into account. So it takes Billy Gates' income and my own income, puts it all together with everyone else, divides by the total number, and you've got your average or mean. So it's useful, and it's our chosen metric because it uses all the data. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, dismiss anything. But it is sensitive to, uh, with income, extremely rich people. Okay, there are a lot of people over on the left side um, of, a, of a ranked horizontal axis, but um, the 1% hang out way on the right. And uh, here's an example of, of, of extreme values, um, or I don't know, it's a picture of, of uh, what the sign says, the flaw of averages instead of the law of averages, I guess. So this guy's walking around, you know, he's in a suit, going to work. He sees a pond, a little puddle, I don't know, a pond. It says an average depth of three feet. And this guy, I don't know why, maybe he's wearing, you know, Wellingtons or some sort of boot there that's waterproof. But he thinks, all right, three feet, I'm six feet. I can walk through that whole thing, no problem. But lo and behold, as he gets to the center, it's that the average is three feet. So the middle turns out to be an extreme value, well over six feet, and this poor guy drowns to his death. That's right. Poor guy dies. Flaw of averages. The median is the center of an ordered list of data. So rank your data from smallest to largest, for example. And whatever the median is, 50% of the observations lie on either side. So it's the 50th percentile. All right. Uh, of course, a percentile, I'll remind you, divides a data set into two. The values don't matter. It doesn't matter what Billy Gates is earning or any unemployed person is earning. It's whatever happens in the middle. So it's resistant to extreme values, but it doesn't give us any sort of data set. It's a singular value. Um, and if you're using the median, then um, the, uh, the measure of variability, okay, is going to be awkward because we want to measure variability relative to something and we have to measure it relative to the mean if we're going to use standard deviation. And so the median doesn't offer that same kind of linkage to the variability of data. So back to this graph, um, I said that this data set is skewed left or left skewed. Uh, you, could, you know that by whichever way the tail kind of drifts off to. Uh, but it needs to be the case, it's necessarily the case, that if the mean is less than the median, if the mean is less than the median, then you have a left skewed data set. And lo and behold, the mean is less than the median. All right. And this is kind of the opposite direction of an income graph. This is a grading distribution. You know, most people are up by the C's, B's, and A's. You know, some people walk away with a 4.6. Hardly, you know, that's, it's hard to earn that. 
but it's possible. You just have to almost do nothing. Uh, anyway, left skewed, like almost all grading distributions would be. So, measures of variability. Um, you can see that these two graphs, uh, well, these two graphs have the same center, but they have different uh, variability, different variation. And so we're going to condense that into um, the variance and the standard deviation. Okay. In this case, they have the same mean, but they have the same different variabilities. Now, you know, if you're comparing populations or samples, I mean, often you'll have different means and different measures of variability. Um, and so if you want to compare data that have different means, uh, you want to control for that. But uh, before we get to that, the variance and standard deviation. So the definition of the variance, the average of the squared distance of the data from the mean. So the mean plays a role. So right there we know that the variance, because it relies on the mean, is also affected by extreme values, also affected by Billy Gates' huge income. Or, for grading, the slacker's 4.6 percentage grade, which is amazing. Um, now, the variance, again, is the squared distance. The reason we square these things is because if you didn't, then you'd have equal deviations below the mean and above the mean, and it would cancel each other out. And we know that because the mean exactly balances the data. So we have to square these bad boys. So if we're talking money, we'd have money squared, or grades would have percentage grades squared. And so that's awkward. So to get it back into the units of the problem, we take the square root, and we're in the standard deviation row. So the standard deviation is kind of the workable form of the variance, but they give you the same information. Okay, if you have one, you have the other. That's it. Um, again, sensitive to extreme values indeed. The formula uh, is, the formulas I, I have handwritten here, um, I, I've actually handwritten them because throughout this course you're going to see me writing, and it does help to kind of get used to my horrible penmanship. And so this is kind of the first slide where you can get in on it. Um, but I do use the, the pen to do some writing and drawing of distributions throughout. Anyway, some notation, some reminder and notation for uh, summation notation, rather. Okay, so I have three examples here. And the first example, and hopefully this cursor shows up in the video, uh, I've got x, which is income. Okay, and I, when you see I here, XI, and sometimes we'll drop the I. Most of the time we drop the I. All right, but, you know, on your textbook you'll see it at the beginning and they drop it too. But the I is just an index. This is like, well, you know, you've got, let's say we're talking about a class of 60 students. You'd have student 1, 2, 3, all the way to 60. So capital N would be the, the population size in that case, of 60. And this says, this thing, this uh, capital sigma says to sum all of these x values from i equals 1 at the bottom to n at the top. So this just says sum everyone in that data set. This one, you'll notice that I've taken away the superscript and the subscript because that's often how you see it. So it's implicit. Now it's implicit that I'm going to be summing from 1 to n from everybody. But first, I'm squaring these terms, x squared. So I'm taking the income of me and squaring it, the income of you and squaring it, and then summing all those squared terms. Now, the difference between 2 and 3 is important. That's why I do this exercise, is that here the parentheses are on the summation. So this is telling me not to square individual terms. This is telling me to sum all of the x values like you did in 1 and then square that sum. So 2 and 3 are totally and dramatically different. So beware. Now the formulas, which uh, use the sigma term. You'll notice that I've dropped the superscript and subscript from the sigma term. And uh, you should expect it to be like that. The variance is uh, following... Uh, the, uh, so you'll see that I have population um, formulas and sample formulas, okay? And you have to learn these. 
not only do you have to learn how they're used, but what they mean, and notice the difference between the notation. Sometimes I'll, I'll say the standard deviation of the sample is as is blah, blah, blah. And sometimes I'll say S squared is blah, 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 which would be the variance in that case. But S <clears throat> is, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you got to be pretty sharp with these things. <clears throat> um, all right, so we'll start with the population, left-hand side. The variance of the population is denoted by lowercase sigma squared, lowercase. All right, this is the uppercase. And it's, again, it's going to be the average of the square deviations from the mean. And so we have mu here. The Greek letter mu is the population mean. X is income or whatever X is, doesn't matter, it's just the placeholder for the variable. And so X minus mu is each deviation from the individual value relative to the mean. In parentheses, I'm squaring this. So this would tell me to sum all these squared values and then divide by the total population size. And that would give me my variance, but it would be unit squared. The standard deviation is simply the square root of that. So it's sigma, lowercase sigma. Now, if I have sample data, and again, we've already talked about the difference between population and sample, then my definition, I'm sorry, my notation is S squared. So notice we have Greek letters for populations, and we have these Roman letters for our traditional alphabetical letters for samples. That will we'll maintain that throughout the course. So, S squared is the sum of the deviations between the mean, but notice it's not the population mean, it's the sample mean. X bar is our sample mean. X bar is just the sum of all the data values divided by little n, and little n is the sample size. Notice the difference between little n and big N is just um, uh, capital and lowercase. So the numerator looks the same, and it, it, it'll actually be, except for the, you know, the substituting the Greek letter for the X bar, but it's the denominator that's that's different. And the denominator is N in the population, but it's N minus 1 in the sample. And the reason we do this is that we lose what's called the degree of freedom. So the denominator is actually called de the degrees of freedom for this problem. And why we lose a, a degree of freedom is that when we had N in our sample, so let's say N is 100 people in our sample. Well, we used that 100 people to calculate X bar. Okay, so we inferred X bar, we estimated the sample mean, right, or the mean from the sample. Every time we take a sample and um, calculate a sample statistic from it, and then use that sample statistic in another calculation like we're doing here, we lose a usable observation. We lose a degree of freedom. All right. So if we then took our, our sample variance and plugged it into another formula, okay, to estimate something else, then we'd lose another degree of freedom. Okay. Now we don't have to do that with the standard deviation; it's just the square root of the variance. It's the same number. It's the square. You know, it's the same piece of information. And so S is the standard deviation. This would tell us the average deviation from the mean of the sample. So um, why variance, why standard deviation? Well, uh, I think I've covered this. I'm going to uh, move on. Uh, standard deviation is in units. And we're going to do a practice question. Pause the video for one moment. OK. Um, I, think we're, I think we're involved here. We're back on. OK, yeah, we're good. Uh, to give us a practice uh, so, or some some uh, uh, some practice with the standard deviation and the variance, um, I have the uh, box office earnings in millions of dollars rounded for the weekend of May 31 to June 2nd in 2013. Fast and Furious 6. Wow, 6, huh? Amazing. $35.2 million in that weekend. Now you see me. 29.4, After Earth, 27.5 million in Star Trek, Into Darkness, 16.8. Nerdy movies is what we're dealing with here. Okay, so the question says, what's the standard deviation of this sample? So I'm just telling you it's a sample, okay? 
and it's pretty easy to work with. Um, you know, ordinarily, if I'm doing this face to face in a classroom, people have calculators, and you know, I try to make it very small. Now, with an online course, you have a little bit more, uh, obviously, flexibility because you can use Excel. But um, nevertheless, I, I still have this four uh, observations. Let me open up Excel, and you'll notice that. Oh, what's this? You know, I'm using a. Uh, I'm using a Mac here, but uh, I'm opening up Excel in Windows. And the reason is I'm going to use a tool called Data Analysis in a minute. And um, the Excel version of the Mac doesn't have it. It's just the uh, it's the sad reality. Um, I'm going to open up the data set. Let's see if I can figure this out. I'm going to pause this for a second while I do it. OK, uh, so we're back. Here is the data set. Again, it's pretty easy to work with. And um, some calculations in Excel, very basic. Uh, if we want, to, we want to calculate the mean, we want to calculate the variance of the sample, and we want to calculate the standard deviation of the sample. All right, extend this a bit. Um, in Excel, we're talking about average is the method. Uh, the variance, if you go equals var, you have two options. var.p is the variance for the population. var.s is the variance for the sample. Um, I've designated this, these four observations as sample data. And the standard deviation is I could just take the square root of that, but you'll see that there's standard dev, stdev, dot p is for the population, dot s is for the sample. <clears throat> and so um, this is the, uh, these are the, the, uh, the sample statistics for this. Now, um, I should say that what we're going to use in this class is this tool set called data analysis. All right. And once you activate it, and I posted a video on how to activate it. Once you activate it, it's there. And you click on it. And you can click on this tool. You know, there's a host of tools here, but there's one called descriptive statistics. And you grab your data. I took a label and you click summary statistics. That's all you need to do. And You've got, uh, what do we get, 27.225, that's our mean. The standard deviation, 7 point, these were our statistics we calculated, 7.68, uh, yep, and 59.03, and uh, there you go. This gives us some other stuff that we'll get into, standard error when we get to chapter 8, the median if you're interested, the mode's not available. Kurtosis and skewness, these two are um, our measures that have to do with uh, the normality of the data set, how normal it is. Don't worry about that. The range is simply the min minus the, uh, the max minus the min, and the maximum minus the minimum are there. Sum is the sum. And count is uh, the sample size, four. Okay. Now descriptive statistics, this, this uh, output, this tool, is only for sample data. It's only for sample data, all right? If you had a population data set, you'd want to just use the population um, uh, tools or uh, formulas, all right? var.p, stdev.p. Because by default, the standard deviation of this is going to be divided by n minus 1, as in the variance as well.